What's up guys, I'm going to show you how to use CPU later for ARM assembly programming. This video will provide the basic features like using instructions, macros, subroutines, and working with external devices. Just to let you know, this is not a tutorial on how to code an ARM assembly, just how to use the CPU later emulator. Let's head over to it right now. Just a Google search. First result. Alright, so CPU later is a great emulator. Why? Because you won't have to download any software or sign up for anything. Just go to the link and you'll be ready to code on it. Alright, on to the tutorial. Oh yeah, you need internet. So we have two versions of ARM 7 we can use on CPU later. There's the basic version, right here, and the advanced version, right here which comes with bells and whistles like buttons, displays, and other external devices. Well, the basic version is just for basic coding, so we're just going to open up the basic version to see how it is. Click go. So here's the basic version. Now we're going to switch over to the advanced version just to see the features. Switch this to the advanced version. Apply and reload. So here's the devices that it comes with. Something cool we can do in both versions is we can rearrange the windows however we want. It's very intuitive. We just drag and drop wherever we want. Click on the blue title bars and you can just move it wherever you want. Same for the dark blue ones, which are the actual windows. Click here. I can drag this wherever I want. Alright, we're not going to use the external devices right now, so I'm just going to switch back to the basic version. So before I do any coding, I'm going to create this infinite loop at the end so we know when the program stops. There we go. Alright, so here's a brief description of each window. By window, I mean the dark blue title bars. So. We write code in the editor window. And when I'm finished, I press compile and load. After that, it'll automatically take me to the disassembly window. Disassembly window keeps track of where the code is line by line. So if we need to debug anything, this is where to go. So I'm going to write a simple code to demonstrate. Compile and load. So if we look at the PC, it shows the address that we're currently at. So this is where our code starts. If I want to go to the next line, go up here to the top left, I press step into. It ran that piece of code, and now we're on the next line. If I go back to the editor, it'll show my code. If I go back to disassembly, it'll show which line we're on in the code. If I want to go to the end of the program, I just go to the top left, I click step out. And it'll take us to our infinite loop. And there we go, we've reached the end of the code. Also, here's how it looks like if we don't have our infinite loop at the end. Remove that. Compile and load. All right, let's run the code to the end. So we've reached the end of the code, and now there's all this, and we get an error. That's what happens if we don't have some way to stop the program. We just keep getting a bunch of errors in the messages window. I'm gonna put it back on now. Also, since we're here, I can demonstrate the registers window. This window contains all the variables. Registers are obviously in the registers section. And if we are using the stack memory, we can find those variables in the symbols area. And also check this out. We can find the specific location of where the variable is within the stack memory just by clicking on the magnifying glass. I'm going to create some code to update the memory so you can see. 
Alright, compile and load. Now check this out. A symbol called memory. Same name as we called it right here. Magnifying glass takes us straight to the memory and it pinpoints where the memory starts and stops. Pretty cool, huh? Alright, so next we have the settings window. I don't really use it that much, but here's how it works. We can change the information displayed on the registers window. Like instead of displaying values as hex, we can switch to sign decimal or unsigned. There are a bunch of other features that I don't really touch, but let's show how it works. So I'm going to change this to 15, this to 2, this to 10. And go to the registers area. Let's run the code. Right now, showing it in hex. If I want to see these registers values in decimal, I'll just go to the settings, decimal, unsigned. There's the value. As you might have seen, we can also change between the different versions of assembly. Just don't forget to hit the apply and reload. Last but not least, we have the messages window. We will get our error codes here. And that's how I set up CPU later. So for this section, I'll just be showing how to work with storing data and loading data, but overall, Writing instructions is no different from writing it normally, if that makes any sense at all. Alright, so I'm going to write some sample code. For this example, I'm going to need a data section. Alright, for this code, I'll load data from the stack memory, add 3 onto it, and then store it back into that memory. So, let's debug this and see if I did this correctly. Compile. Alright. Step into, and we'll be looking at these registers. So now we're loading it. We should be getting the number six. All right. So number six is displaying on number zero. Register zero. And now we're adding three. Nice. Now we have to store it back into the memory. Let's see. Alright, so let's check the memory. Go to the symbols. Ace. Nine. That is correct. So for this part of the video, I'll be demonstrating branches, macros, and subroutines. I'll show you that they function properly, but most importantly, I'll be showing you how to use uh, branches because there's an error that can occur if they aren't used in a specific manner. So I just created a macro. What it does is it adds one onto the value X amount of times. If we go into the disassembly window and run this code, we'll see that the macro works. We'll be adding on to R3 five times. Let's see the value that we get. Here's R3 right now before we start stepping into the code. All right, let's see the value that we got. R3 is equal to five. Let's go. If we try to debug the subroutine, let's check it out. So we just entered the debug of the subroutine. We're able to see the line by line code. Now let's see the value that we got. We got A. And if I switch the settings to decimal, we'll see that it's equal to 10. So we're doing the same thing. We're going five times, but with the subroutine, we're adding two instead of one. All right, the code works. All right, so onto the branches. Check this out. Let's say I wanted to use this macro twice. 
copy paste. We run into an error. Well, I'll show you how to fix it. For some reason, we can't use named labels. We have to use numbered labels. I think it has to do with numbered labels being localized while named labels are considered as global labels. So I'll change this to one, one. Then after the numbers, we can write a F or a B. B means to call the label behind this. And F means to use the label after this. So let's say I was using two number two, one labels. It would be able to differentiate which one to use first. And we're not using this one, so I'm just gonna go behind. There we go. And now if I run the code again, compile, no errors, the code ran well, we got the number 10. All right, so that's basically it. On to the bells and whistles. So I'm gonna switch over to the advanced version of ARM 7. I'm gonna show you how to use a couple of these external devices. It's actually very simple, but I don't mind demonstrating this because it's the fun part. Before we begin, I wanna point out that each device displays its address on the top right, making it easier to locate where it's stored in memory. And check out all these devices we can play around with. But yeah, here's the addresses. First device we'll use is the display window. It's called the GTAG UR. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to display text on it and also receive keyboard text from it. So here's how the input works. There's this box called the read FIFO. So I'm going to click in here. All right, now I'm going to type. I can type anything that I want and it'll store it in there. So for this program, I'm going to read the text that I put in here, decode it, and then print it on the screen so you can see what it actually shows. So I'm going to type stuff and it's not actually going to show what the letters are. It's going to be in All right, I'm finished now. coding. Now let's check out the program. Every time we read from here, it's going to decrease this value. I'm just pressing, I'm stepping into, I'm using the hotkey F2. Oh yeah, also one drawback to using the display is it only displays one character at a time. And here's what I mean. So if I step out of the code, it should display everything, which I'll do now. Well, uh, I might have missed something there. But yeah, there we go. I just loaded the address in and stored a value into the address. Let's say we need to use the display again. The thing is, I'm going to run it. I'm going to continue the code to the end. And it keeps adding on to what we have already. So here's how we clear the text on the display. This down arrow, clear terminal, and that's how you clear the screen. All right, so now I'm going to show you how it works with the LEDs and then we can end this video. So I'm gonna grab the address. All right, so the code is finished. What it's gonna do is it's gonna keep storing R0 into the LED address, and R0 is gonna keep incrementing by one until we hit 12, and we're gonna see how it lights up the LEDs. Right now the LEDs are off. I'm gonna compile and load. All right, let's check this out. Right now it's zero. Oh yeah, I forgot. It does not take a byte, it takes a word. Compile and load. Oh, and I was able to know that because this error popped up. JP does not support byte, half, and all that. All right. Rerun the code. It's at zero. It's at one. It's at two, three, four. 
Program's finished. We have reached 12. All right. Well, hope you liked this video. Hope it helped you learn more on how to use CPU later.